Let's talk about how you select tooling for machining. First off, material. As a general rule, you're going to use end mills for aluminum and end mills for steel. And maybe stainless steel is different and plastics can be different and so forth. But for me and for most folks, I think it's really aluminum and steel. And the differences between those two can relate not only to the coating, which is obvious because it's a color, but it can actually also relate to the grind and then obviously the number of flutes that you want to use. For aluminum, we always use a three flute, which is a little unusual because many use two flutes. We'll talk about that in a different video from Lakeshore Carbide. And for steel, we use a four or five flute steel for, uh, carbide end mill from Lakeshore Carbide as well. Carbide does matter. There's a difference in carbide from the junky stuff maybe you buy, discount bin, eBay, whatever, and quality tools. I do like Lakeshore Carbide. They are helping us put the series out. They're not the only manufacturer of great carbide. But my emphasis here, my point here, is that quality does matter. Not all carbide is equal. Not all the way it's ground and prepped and cut and coated is equal. The other big thing I really want to emphasize that I think is way too often overlooked is length of cut or length of flute. Buy stubby end mills, folks. So often, so many folks are cutting with the last 50 thou of an end mill. And maybe that's okay, but don't buy an end mill with, with half an inch or seven eighths of an inch flute length. You're buying unnecessary carbide, you're spending way too much money on unused carbide, and you're sacrificing huge amounts of rigidity. That's the biggest thing. It's, a, it's one crime to waste some end mill. It's a bigger crime, in my opinion, to underuse the tooling and the machine and the work uh, removal rates and everything else. A lot of what we've moved to is using tools like the shear hog to rip, rip out a lot, and then we use finish end mills like solid carbide tooling to finish it up. So again, stubby end mills, like the one you see here, they normally do the trick for us. At the end of the day, Every carbide tool only has so much life to, that it can cut. Those edges can only make so many little cuts, period. It just, there's, nothing, there's no way around it. So by buying stubby length end mills, they're more rigid, you get better cuts, and you're gonna use more of the tooling you bought. So you might as well get as deep a cut as you can before your tool runs out, which is a good segue into length of cut and width of cut. So why maximize depth of cut or axial cut. Well, if you wear out the last 50 thou of that tip, the top whole portion of that flute is basically worthless because you're not going to be able to cut with it if the bottom few thou is worn out. So I'm told studies were done or, or tests were done that more depth of cut or greater axial with a thinner width of cut, which means by the way that you can run at a higher inches per minute, will outperform the opposite. Shallow depth of cut, bigger width of cut, a little bit slower. In other words, it's not an equal trade-off and you will outperform taking thin width of cuts going really fast than the opposite. I'll come back to that with a caveat though. What dictates your ability to take an axial or depth of cut? It's not the machine, folks. Lots of people think that it is. It's the tool rigidity setup and material. Machine rigidity and spindle horsepower are not what drive it because the same machine requirements apply to a thin width of cut with a deep depth of cut and the opposite. Thin depth of cut, deep width of cut. So that's not an excuse, folks. So how do you determine length and width of cut? Use as much length of cut as you can. In that material, say, maybe you can only take 0.2 or 0.3 inch depth of cut. Now, try to buy an end mill that has 0.3 or so inch flute length. You're staying, you're staying rigid, or you're using all the tool that you bought. And for width of cut, Carl really recommends don't go above 30% width of cut. So in a 1 8 inch end mill, that's about 0.08 inches. Again, this is going back to this idea, deep axial cut, thin radial or thin width of cut. Why 30%? Well, here's the thing. As you increase your width of cut, you're increasing the risk, basically, that you're going to recut the chip. It all comes back to chip evacuation and recutting chips. And if and when you do that, things can and will go downhill very quickly. Because recutting chips, 
will massively impact tool deflection, it'll impact surface finish, accuracy, chip load, machine horsepower requirements going into that tool, and ultimately you can end up bogging down that tool. You, you may not realize it, um, but as soon as you start doing that, and if you say dull that edge or create problems along the tool, now the tool is itself takes more horsepower to cut and it's, you're never going to recover. Now here's the thing. We'll take a look at this Excel file. We have two different recipes and we're going to zigzag both of these in a future video. But basically, here's my thing. 30% width of cut is great. It's more reliable. You can maybe do it with unattended machining where you're off doing something else and you're gonna have, as a general rule, good, good chip evacuation. And a lot of times, like in the test cut we just did on the Tormach 440 with no coolant at all, that thin width of cut means that the chips are actually getting themselves blown out and you don't need coolant. And again, if you remember from the video series we did on CNC coolant basics, coolant does three things. Evacuates the chip, actually cools the part in the tool, and lubricates. For us and for most folks, chip evacuation is the most important. With that thinner width of cut or thinner radial cut, the chips evacuate themselves. Awesome. Here's the problem with a 30% width of cut. On a machine like the Tormach, we can zigzag that up, which we're gonna do in a video here, but you're going to hit your RPM limit way before you hit the machine horsepower limit. So I'm leaving a lot on the table. The only way to get more material removal rate, unfortunately, is to increase that width of cut, and that's okay to do. You just have to understand it's a little riskier. And we're gonna actually run a cut up to, I think, 75% width of cut, and it's fine. There's no problem with it. It's just the risk is there, the risk that you don't evacuate the chips. If your coolant line gets bumped and, it, and then all of a sudden it's not blowing in the right spot, if you dive into a corner on a, on a cam operation and it can't evacuate that chip, lots of little things can happen where at the end of the day, you might decrease tool life, break the tool, you know, have a problem with service finish or quality or so forth. But if you're paying attention, it's okay. There's nothing intrinsically wrong with a higher width of cut. Forgot to mention one thing, also very important, buy corner radius end mills when you can. Even a five thou radius is minimal in terms of what it's going to do to the part. And hey, look, if you need a square shoulder, you need a square shoulder. It's fine to buy perfect 90 degree end mills, but most of the time you can get by with say a five thou radius corner end mill. Customer is usually not gonna know. Frankly, putting that little bit of radius in there can actually avoid a stress riser in the part. But most importantly, that's what is most likely going to break first on an end mill. It's that very tight, tiny pointed corner that has the least support or intrinsic strength. And when it breaks, it's a downward spiral. So those corner radius can last a lot longer. They can end up leaving a better surface finish because that tip point isn't marred or, or caused, damaged or chipped. And it's really just a good way to go. Again, assuming that the work job part requirements allow it. Here's a 5 16 a Lakeshore carbide three fluid end mill that we use in aluminum. And again, you can barely tell, but this has a 325 thou radius ground right into the tip there. Barely noticeable, but folks will extend the life of the tool and will extend the longevity of this tool, making a good surface finish cut. And there, you can just ever so barely make out the radius.